Hello and welcome back to this series on work, power and energy. So far we have investigated the concept of work from a scientific point of view. We saw that work is done when a force on an object causes the object to move in the same direction as the force. We have looked at examples of work where the force is applied at an angle smaller than 90 degrees. And we have learned that sometimes no work is done, even when a force is applied. We've defined work as the product of the component of the force along the direction of the displacement and the magnitude of the displacement. We have also used this equation to calculate work done in a couple of examples. It's important to remember that a force only does work on an object while it stays in contact with the object. In this lesson, we will explore the relationship between work and energy. We will pay special attention to what scientists call the work energy theorem. By the end of the lesson, you should be able to state the work energy theorem and solve basic problems using the work energy theorem. Oh good, that must be Chad calling in. Hello Chad, we've just recapped what we've learned about work so far. Hello Miss Rosie, I went through my notes before I called so I'm up to speed too. Great. Bearing in mind what you know about work, I would like you to think about whether there could be a relationship between work and energy. In science, we say that a body that has the capacity to do work possesses energy. So energy is the ability to do work. For example, water in a reservoir has energy because it could be used to turn a turbine lower down the valley. So, a body cannot perform work if it does not possess energy. And a body cannot perform more work than the amount of energy it possesses. Something important to take note of here is that energy is also a scalar quantity and the unit of energy is also the joule. That makes sense. I mean, energy has no direction. Correct. Can you still remember what the two main types of energy are? Yes, um, kinetic energy and potential energy, right? Right. Kinetic energy is the energy of an object due to its motion and potential energy is the energy of an object due to its position. The sum of kinetic energy and potential energy is known as mechanical energy. Examples of potential energy include gravitational energy, chemical energy, elastic energy and electromagnetic energy. Examples of kinetic energy include energy in moving objects, heat, sound waves and solar energy. Let's look at the equations we use to calculate energy. Previously, we discovered that work done against gravity can be calculated by using the equation work is equal to mass times gravitational acceleration times displacement times cos theta. In this equation, displacement is equal to the height lifted and cos theta is equal to 1. Because height forms part of this work equation, we can also say that the work done against gravity is equal to the potential energy gained. In other words, potential energy is calculated by mass times gravitational acceleration times height. This type of potential energy is sometimes referred to as gravitational potential energy. Great, I get that. But what about kinetic energy? That doesn't have anything to do with height, does it? No, it doesn't. Kinetic energy is the energy that a body possesses because of its motion. Kinetic energy depends on the mass and velocity of a body. It is the product of the mass and velocity of a moving object. If the velocity of a body is zero, then the kinetic energy will also be zero. Now that we have these two equations, I want us to have a look at the relationship between the change in kinetic energy and the net work done. This relationship is called the work energy theorem. A good way to demonstrate this relationship is to look at the work done when using a hammer. 
When we use a hammer to knock a nail into wood, the hammer does work on the nail. We know that work is done on the nail because we can see the nail move. The hammer pushes the nail and it is displaced. It moves deeper into the wood. The hammer performed this work on the nail, so the hammer must have possessed energy. It is kinetic energy. How much kinetic energy do you think the hammer possessed? To answer this question, we can use the formula for kinetic energy. Kinetic energy equals half times mass times the squared velocity. Why don't you try to calculate the hammer's kinetic energy using the following information. The hammer has a mass of 1,5 kilograms. The velocity of the hammer is 1,8 meters per second. Okay, let's give this a try. Using the formula kinetic energy equals half mass times velocity squared, I first substitute the information and multiply half of 1,5 by 1,8 squared. So the kinetic energy is 2,43 joule. Great work, Chad. Now let's get back to that relationship between energy and work we talked about earlier. The work energy theorem states that the net work done on an object is equal to the change in its kinetic energy. Simply put, this means that the change in the kinetic energy is equal to the net work done. We can write this mathematically as work is equal to final kinetic energy minus initial kinetic energy. If we now use our kinetic energy equation, we can also write this as half of the mass of the object times final velocity squared minus initial velocity squared. Can you see how the net work is the same as the change in kinetic energy? I wonder if you can think of a situation when we could apply the work energy theorem. Have a look at this example. Here, a car with a mass of 1,000 kilograms traveling at 30 meters per second has its speed reduced to 10 meters per second by a constant braking force over a distance of 75 meters. Let's start by extracting the important information given. The car's mass is 1,000 kilograms. Initially, it is traveling at 30 meters per second, but its speed is reduced to 10 meters per second by a constant braking force over a distance of 75 meters. So, what we have is the mass, initial and final velocities, and displacement. That's it. Have a look at the kinds of questions you could be asked to solve. Find the car's initial kinetic energy. Find the car's final kinetic energy. Find the net work done. In other words, the change in kinetic energy and find the braking force. What do you think we need to use to solve these questions? I think we could use the work energy theorem. Correct. Remember, the work energy theorem states that the net work equals the change in the object's kinetic energy. Can you think of an equation to use to answer the first question? Find the initial kinetic energy of the car. What about kinetic energy equals half mass times velocity squared? Absolutely. If we substitute our given information into this equation, we get half times 1,000 times 30 squared. Using a calculator, we can work this out and get 450,000 joule, which is 450 kilojoule. We can find the final kinetic energy of the car using the same equation. Why don't you give it a try? Okay. I start with the equation final kinetic energy equals half mass times velocity squared. This gives me half times 1,000 times 10 squared, so the answer is 50,000 joule, which is the same as 50 kilojoule. Good work, Chad. We have now answered the first two questions. The initial kinetic energy is 450,000 joule, and the final kinetic energy is 50,000 joule. Next, we need to find the net work done. Remember, this is equal to the change in kinetic energy. To do this, we use the work energy theorem definition, 
which we write as net work equals final kinetic energy minus initial kinetic energy. If we substitute the answers we got into this equation, we see that the net work is minus 400,000 joule. Note that the change in kinetic energy is minus 400,000 joule. The net work done on the car is negative. This is important as it tells us the kinetic energy of the car decreases when the car breaks. So what do you think positive net work tells us? I'm sure you've got it. When positive net work is done on an object, it means that the object's kinetic energy increases. So, if your calculation shows a negative net work, you know that the kinetic energy of the object decreased. And if your calculation shows positive net work, you know the kinetic energy increased. That's really cool. Indeed. We can also say that if the net force exerted on an object is opposite to the object's direction of motion, it decreases its speed and its kinetic energy. Let's answer the last question and find the braking force acting on the car. Remember that work done equals force times displacement times cos theta. And the work energy theorem states that work done equals the change in kinetic energy. The breaking force, F, is solved by substituting in what we know the displacement was, 75 meters. Theta is 180 degrees because the force is in the opposite direction to the displacement and the change in kinetic energy was 400,000 joule. So for F, we divide 400,000 joule by 75 times cos 180 degrees, or 75 times minus 1. The answer is 5,333,33 Newton, correct to two decimal places. Right, let's recap what we have discovered in this lesson. We have investigated the relationship between work and energy that is summarized in the work energy theorem. This theorem states that the change in kinetic energy is equal to the net amount of work done. We have seen that this theorem can be written mathematically as net work equals final kinetic energy minus initial kinetic energy or as half of mass times the difference between final velocity squared and initial velocity squared. By doing simple calculations, we have seen that when the net work done on an object is positive, then the object's kinetic energy increases. If the net work done on an object is negative, its kinetic energy decreases. I'm sure that means that if the net work done on an object is zero, its kinetic energy remains constant, which means that its speed is constant. Yes, Chad. I hope you enjoyed working with us today. I did. Thanks. I'll definitely join you for more lessons in this series. That's great news. See you again soon. Here is a task to keep you busy in the meantime, and it's all about the work energy theorem. The driver of a 1,100 kilogram car Travelling at 16 meters per second, applies the brakes so that the car slows uniformly until it comes to rest after 40 meters. Calculate the net work done by the braking force, the net force exerted by the brakes, and the net work done by the time that the car's speed has halved. In other words, dropped to 8 meters per second. For more information, please visit our website on www.mindset.co.za forward slash learn.